Right, so we're going to go through now Air Equilibria Energetics and Elements from June 2014. It starts off with a standard Form 1 Harbour Cycle, gives you lots of data, and you need to first of all complete this Form 1 Harbour Cycle here. So, what the key things to notice is you have got two potassiums here as you go through, you're going to have another two here, so you need to remember to times everything by two for potassium. So the first step here, I've got to get to two potassium plus in the gases state. So here, you're going to have two K in the gas, not done anything with uh, sulfur at all. Then you're going to um, do the first ionization energy of potassium there. The next stage, I'm going to do the first electron affinity of sulfur. So one of those electrons pops on to sulfur, and I have just one electron now, and then finally, up at the top, I'm going to put both of those electrons onto sulfur to make a sulfide ion, so I can now do the lattice entropy as this arrow here. Okay, so you've got a basic definition there, which should be too difficult for you to do. And then you need to use the Born Harbour cycle to calculate the lattice entropy of potassium sulfide. Um, now, I won't go through this. The answer is um, going to be minus 2116 kilojoules per mole. The key mistake that people make is they don't times your potassium values by two as you go through the cycle. Okay, we've now got our, we've got some ionic radii here, and it wants us to predict the order of melting points for potassium bromide, potassium iodide, and rubidium chloride. Notice these are all group one, so they've all got a plus charge. These are all group seven, so they're all going to have a minus charge. And I've got to predict it from the highest, sorry, from the lowest melting point to the highest. So the one which is going to have the lowest melting point. Um, is going to be potassium iodide. Uh, so you're going to go with Ki. Uh, your next one is going to be rubidium chloride. And then finally, the highest melting point is going to be sodium chloride. You obviously need to use your periodic table for that one. But you're looking, the key thing, they've all got plus, single plus charges for group one, single negative charges for group seven. So you're looking at the size of the ions. The two largest ions, if you look here, are going to be the distance between those two is larger than the distance between those two, which again is going to be larger than the distance between those two. So they're giving you the information. They're giving you the information in the table. They generally want you to use it. That's always a good idea. So you can easily see that that distance, if you add them together, is going to be the larger one, and that one's going to be the smallest one. Um, and again, you need to talk about your charge on iron is going to be the same, but because the size of the iron is different, you've got a higher charge density. Um, the higher the charge density, the stronger the ions will attract each other, and therefore you need more energy to overcome that attraction, hence the higher melting point. Okay, so we've now got some um, questions about entropy. Um, quite a nice one to start off with. So we're gonna have to explain for each one, does the entropy increase or decrease? And um, just a brief explanation. Remember, it's only one mark for, for the whole thing. So freezing of water, the entropy of the system is obviously gonna decrease um, because the disorder is decreasing. As the water molecules go from a liquid where they're all moving around into a solid state where they're all in fixed position, so the entropy decreases. Reaction of calcium carbonate with hydrochloric acid. Well, the key thing you need to know um, from really your AS chemistry is that you're going to produce carbon dioxide gas. As soon as you produce a gas, the entropy of the system increases. So it increases because I am forming a gas. Um, part three, formation of O3 from O2. Okay, so you may not remember your um, equations, you may not know. However, uh, what's it like to do? I am making O3. So you can do yourself a quick from O2. Um, obviously, I've got three there. So if I do one and a half O2 to give me O3, you can see the number of gaseous molecules is actually decreasing. 
as I go through that stage. So the entropy is also uh, decreases. Um, one and a half moles goes to one mole. Um, right, and then finally, entropy and entropy of a reaction both have a negative sign. Explain how the feasibility of the reaction will change as temperature increases. You need to use your Gibbs free energy equation to get this to work. Right, so I like to just write Gibbs free energy equation here. Give myself a little note, that negative and that is negative as well. Remember, Gibbs free energy must be negative for it to be feasible. So, that's going to stay the same. This term is going to be affected by temperature. I've got a negative and a negative, so overall, this is a positive value. Delta S will stay the same, that's the entropy of the uh, reaction. But as you increase temperature, minus T delta S becomes more positive. As it becomes more positive, delta G will become less negative and therefore it becomes less feasible as you increase temperature. Uh, right, the next one we're going to actually do some calculations. I've popped up on the board here so you can see quite quickly. Uh, delta S for the reaction is the sum of the entropy values of the products minus the sum of the entropy values of the reactants. If you do that, uh, your products are tungsten and water. Remember, water you've got to times by three here. Uh, you've then got tungsten oxide and hydrogen as your reactants. Remember, in the hydrogen here, you have to times by three. I would work out the brackets first, so that becomes 600, that's minus 469, and that gives you a value of minus 131 kilojoules per mole. Uh, right, so they now want me to calculate the minimum temperature at which this reaction becomes feasible. The minimum temperature is delta G is equal to zero. So you can rearrange uh, the Gibbs free energy equation to give you the temperature is delta H minus delta S. Delta H, they gave us, remember, that was at the top of the equation, here, um, so I can bung that in. You do need to remember this is a key thing that people forget is this delta G value that we just, sorry, um, this delta S value that, uh, right, so we've now worked out delta S uh, for the reaction. The key thing, oh, and that is actually joules per mole. Okay, I need to remember that when I put that into my delta G expression, this has to be converted into kilojoules per mole, which is 0.131 kilojoules per mole. And of course that is uh, uh, going to be per Kelvin as well, per Kelvin. Um, so once I've done that, um, I've now got that into the right. Remember your temperature, they've given you 25 degrees, you've got to convert that into um, Kelvin, which is 298 Kelvin, um, that they gave you in the equation uh, as delta H, so it's that number minus 298 times 0.131, which gives you 76 kilojoules per mole. I now need to calculate the minimum temperature. To calculate the minimum temperature, delta G is going to equal zero. Um, so when you've got that, uh, T, uh, delta uh, temperature is going to equal delta H uh, minus delta S. Uh, delta H they gave us as being 115 as we used up there. Delta S we've already worked out as being 0.1. So if you do that expression, you should get 878, and remember it's in Kelvin. Okay, on to some uh, equilibrium now. Uh, Given me an equilibrium expression, and they want me to calculate Kc. Remember square brackets. Kc is going to be the concentration of hydrogen gas, and that's going to be cubed, times the concentration of Fi divided by the concentration, oh and let's just be careful that is actually gas as well, divided by the concentration of methane and that's going to be squared like so. Um, so that's not too bad. Calculate the amount in mole of hydrogen in uh, the equilibrium mixture. 
Okay, so they told me the equilibrium mixture contains 0.36 times centimeters cubed moles of methane. I've got 0.168 moles of C2H2. For every one of those made, I make three of those. So the moles of H2 is going to be three times 0.168, uh, uh, which comes to 0. I'll make it zero four moles. Right over the next one. You've done the hard work. You've worked out. Well, they've given you two of the uh, moles at equilibrium. The main thing to realise is uh, in the question they told me that the volume was four decimeters cubed. So you divide each of these numbers, each of these moles, by four to give you the concentrations of each of these values. You then bung these into case a key mistake people make is they try and do it too fast to make a calculator error. Please don't do that. Work these out individually if you want to, just to make sure you've got these right. But it really is a matter of transferring these numbers into your KC that you've just done. Remember, it hydrogen is cubed um, and methane is squared. Um, and then once you've done that, you should get 0.153. Remember, you, they wanted three significant figures, so make sure you do it. Your units, mole squares, decimeters to the minus six. Um, if you think about it, it's going to be moles per decimeter cubed, moles per decimeter cubed, cubed, divided by moles per decimeter cubed, squared. That cancels with that and cancels with one of those. So your overall is mole squared. And remember, when you do these, um, it's moles per decimeter cube squared is moles decimeters to the minus six. All right, so this is a funny little question that freaks people out. Um, calculate the amount of mole of methane that was originally added. So they told me at the beginning of the question that equilibrium, I had that number of moles of methane, and that number of moles of C2H2. If you think about it, for every two of those, I only get one of those. So originally, if I go back that way, I must have had two times as many moles of methane as I got of C2H2. So the answer is 9.36 times 10 to the minus two, plus two times 0.168. Check out your mole ratio when you're doing it. For every one of those, when I go backwards, I make two of them. It's basic AS stuff when you were doing your calculating, uh, reacting quantities stuff. Well, anyway, so now we need to look at um, three changes and the effect on KC, equilibrium amount of C2H2 and the initial rate. So the first thing is I'm going to heat it up. Remember, they told us it was an endothermic reaction. So. When I heat something up from Le Chatelier, I know it goes in the endothermic direction. So what's going to happen to Kc? Well, if it's going that way, this boy's going to get uh, greater. Equilibrium amount of C2H2. Well, again, that is going to be greater because I'm shifting this direction. And the rate is also going to be uh, greater because um, my temperature. Temperature speeds up right? A smaller container is used. Okay, so um, if a smaller container is used, that means I'm effectively changing pressure. Does pressure expect KC? No way. So KC will be the same. Um, if I've got a higher pressure, which way will it shift? Well, I've got four moles of gas that, two moles of gas that, so increased pr uh, pressure shifts it that way. So the equilibrium amount will actually be smaller. The initial rate, the pressure is greater, uh, and therefore the rate will be greater. A catalyst is added. Kc, not affected by a catalyst. Equilibrium amount, again, not affected by a catalyst. And rate, we know, is affected by a catalyst and will be greater. Uh, finally then, for this question, um, in the manufacture, um, we also produce hydrogen. Um, how can we use hydrogen? Okay, hydrogen, well, you would have done fuel cells, um, so obviously uh, at A2, so fuel cells is good. You probably remember manufacturing margarine from AS chemistry with the old alkenes, um, and the main one that most people uh, bang out 